Good afternoon. I'm Reagan Zimmerman. And I'm Lily Zoller. Welcome to the Badger Report. Today, we will have updates on Tuesday's election and all other events on campus. In one of the most hotly contested presidential elections in recent memory, there was an increased voter turnout, particularly in Wisconsin. Tune into the Badger Report to find out the latest updates. Children in isolation face mental health issues, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic. Take a look at how Dane County is working with local mental health clinics to solve this pressing issue. Also, we'll show you how some UW students are saving lives. Find out more on the Badger Report. From Vilas Hall on the campus of the University of Wisconsin-Madison, this is the Badger Report. It's been three days since voters went to the polls to choose their candidate for president, and yet we still don't know who the winner will be. As of right now, AP has Democratic candidate Joe Biden leading the election by a total of 264 to 214 electoral votes. The candidates still await results from four states, Pennsylvania, North Carolina, Georgia, and Nevada. All four of these states were swing states to watch during the election along with Florida, Michigan, and Wisconsin. After Trump took Florida, Biden countered by flipping Arizona shortly after the focus shifted to our native state of Wisconsin. With 10 electoral votes up for grabs, Biden ultimately won by a narrow margin. The president is demanding a recount of the Wisconsin totals. This year's election saw an increase in voter turnout with a record 3.2 million votes. While Trump has said he will call for a recount, election officials say it is insulting to local officials to say that Tuesday's election was anything but a success. The Badger Report's Nathan Denzine has the story. Thanks, Lily. After nearly 2 million Wisconsinites cast absentee ballots before Election Day this year, more went out to the polls on Tuesday, setting a state record for turnout with over 3.2 million votes cast. In Wisconsin, in-person voting and absentee counting went according to plan, despite the coronavirus pandemic. We have people voting at the polls today. Sounds like that is going pretty well citywide. And uh, we don't expect that COVID is going to affect our numbers other than uh, just shifting a lot of votes from voting at the polls on election day to having voted absentee. With more poll workers at election places than ever before in the city, Madison was able to have a fairly routine election day been pretty quiet and uneventful. Some questions on, can you send us more hand sanitizer or more disinfectant spray? So we know that they are uh, constantly sanitizing and disinfecting, uh, which is good news as well. As a whole, Wisconsin saw a smooth election day, with Biden announced as the winner of the state by Wednesday afternoon. While Trump has said he will call for a recount, local officials say Tuesday's election was a success. Thanks, Nathan. This election was filled with many surprises and changes. UW-Madison professor and expert in politics, Howard Schwaber, joins us to break down the 2020 election. Thanks for joining us, Professor Schwaber. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. So, Professor Schwaber, with this election being affected by the COVID-19 pandemic, there were a lot of changes with voting. Many filled in either absentee or mail-in ballots. So with this weird election, what surprised you the most? Um, so a couple of things. Uh, this is the second election in a row in which we've seen the polls turn out to be really unreliable barometers of the level of support that President Trump has. Uh, I, I was not startled by the increase in turnout of voters for Biden. I was surprised by the increase in turnout of voters for Trump. Not that, they, not that there were voters for Trump and a lot of them and a solid number, but how much the number went out and how successful he was in mobilizing voters. Um, I'm a little surprised, given all the difficulties that the COVID virus imposed on the process, just how, well, just how big the turnout overall has been. Um, um, assuming, as appears probable, that Joe Biden will be the next president, he'll be elected with the largest number of votes ever received by a candidate, uh, and Trump is not at all far behind him. So this was a very active, very vigorous 
a uh, very contested election right right from the beginning. Uh, and, I, and I think that's almost the most striking thing, how little uh, the coronavirus did to dampen participation or enthusiasm or commitment on the part of the voters. That is really interesting. So overall, you would say that you think the pandemic changed people's interest about voting in a positive direction? Well, I think it changed two things. It changed the way people voted, obviously. The use of absentee ballots was, was tremendously higher than we had ever seen before. Attempts to avoid lines by voting early. In terms of what the coronavirus as an issue did for voters, um, there are some interesting indications that while Biden voters were motivated because they viewed the U.S. government's response as poor, a lot of Trump voters were motivated because they approve of the way the president is handling the coronavirus. So it was assumed to be a, a an anchor that would weigh down Trump and his uh, weigh down Trump's chances has turned out to be just one more divided partisan issue uh, that just con confirms the biases uh, and the and the strength of attachment of both bases. All right, so we have one time for one question left. Um, so I'm just curious. So Trump is asking for a, a recount of the votes. Do you mm -hmm. have anything to say about that? Well, uh, as long as the margin is within 1%, he's entitled to a recount, although if it's above 0.25%, he has to pay for it. Um, the real point is that in the history of Wisconsin recounts, there has never been a recount that produced a change of more than a few hundred votes. Trump is, is losing Wisconsin by 20,000. I would say that there is a near zero probability that a recount in Wisconsin will, will do anything to change the outcome. And in general, this whole discussion about recounts and challenging ballots is unlikely to bear much fruit unless everything comes down to a single state, as it did in 2000. You know, if things come down to a single state, then those court challenges can become decisive. But if we're talking about three or four states, uh, I, I expect to, have, to see a lot more noise than actual outcome. So just in the last couple of days, for example, there have been multiple lawsuits in Pennsylvania uh, and a couple other places by Trump, uh, by, by Trump campaign lawyers. Uh, they've won some things, they've lost some things, but the, the swing in votes as a result has been measured in the hundreds. Thank you for your time, Professor Schwaber. My pleasure. For the first time since 1962, there will be a new congressman in Wisconsin's 26th district. The replacement for Fred Risser, the longest serving congressman in U.S. history, is Kelda Helen Royce, who ran unopposed in the 26th district. In other election news, we have results from Wisconsin's 2nd District congressional election. In the race for a spot in the U.S. House, incumbent Mark Pocan came out victorious over Peter Thorin in a landslide, receiving 69.7% of the vote. Madison voters have voted to support two requests from the school district. The first, a $33 million operating referendum, and the second, a $317 million facilities referendum. The facilities referendum will renovate the district's four main high schools and add a new elementary school. Construction on the schools should be completed by 2024. While election results weren't announced in Wisconsin until Wednesday morning, I traveled around the Madison area on election night to gauge voters' expectations following the vote. Is this the first time that you're voting in a presidential election? Yes, it is. Yes, ma'am, it is. This is my first time. Students who voted for the first time believe their ballots are always important, but more so this year than before. I just think it's part of being an American that like, you should go out and vote whenever you can. But I think this is like a critical point in history, and I think that a lot of issues are at stake. I decided that it was really important that I voted. Records broke across the country as voter turnout numbers were higher than ever, but this didn't keep people from being on edge. When it's not the people's vote, it's the vote of, the, of few for the everyone else. That's nerve-wracking. Some residents made it clear that people must step up to the plate. But, you know, I'm more of the stance that the power is more in the people than the elected representatives. So I think it's more or less our, all of our duty, no matter what happens, to ensure that, uh, ensure that our country is safe. Environmental activist group Sunrise Madison coordinated a watch party at the Capitol to ensure people's voices were heard making a clear statement to Wisconsin that we really value democracy and counting every single vote. The results That sounds like a long night. It definitely was. Thanks, Reagan. 2020 not only saw high voter turnout, but also a lot of volunteer poll workers. So many young people um, 
pretty much everybody who's come in has been a young person other than like maybe like two or three um, that I've been here for and I've been working since three. As COVID-19 cases spike in Wisconsin, six patients are now being treated at the alternative care facility at the Wisconsin State Fair Park. The overflow facility is equipped to support COVID-19 patients who are in stable condition where they will receive oxygen and, ge and general low level care. Patients who are moved into the facility will take pressure off of state hospitals by creating space for people who are seriously ill with the virus. Cases are still on the rise in Wisconsin with more than 5,900 new cases reported on Thursday. Wow, Reagan, that's a lot of cases. I'm hoping to see those numbers go down soon. While communities are being cautious about the COVID-19 virus, let's take a look at how the Progress Center is providing families with safe Halloween activities. UW students who have recovered from COVID-19 have been first to help those currently fighting the virus. Tune into the Badger Report to see how UW-Madison students are donating their plasma to contribute to research that may save lives. Next on the Badger Report. You can try, but you'll never stop a badger. Because we badgers are born with curious minds and endless heart. When we see a curve in the road, we speed up. When there are mask shortages for first responders, we make our own supply chain. When there's a world on pause, we sharpen our claws. Through thunder, fire, and pandemics, we'll keep going. Because after all, you can't stop a badger. Last weekend, Halloween celebrations were a bit different than we're used to. No trick-or-treating, no hanging out with friends, and no opportunities to show off our creative costumes while strutting down the street. The Badger Reports, Tamia Folks, takes a look at how one community organization celebrated Halloween. Throughout the course of the pandemic, the Progress Center for Black Women has been hard at work expanding their outreach opportunities to members of the community with their progress band and socially distanced events like Progress Pies and Pumpkins, an event which served over 130 families with pumpkin painting kits, candy, community resources, and food items from three local Black-owned businesses. And we just want to make sure that we're still creating engaging programming for families, um, giving them an opportunity to um, receive support, receive joy and like have that experience as well as like become aware of especially our new van um, and how that mobile resource is still playing a, a prominent role in the community. In addition to this event, the organization recently launched their Progress Van, a mobile resource to aid community members in accessing food, Wi-Fi, and other identified needs within the community. Stuff like this just gives folks an opportunity to sort of like have hope. Because when folks can't make, pay their bills, pay their car notes, have transportation, have food, you do lose hope. You feel like nothing is going to work, no one's going to help me, I'm all alone out here. And what we've always been able to do with our work is say, no, you're not. You're not alone. For the Badger Report, I'm Tamia Folks. Thanks, Tamia. Freakfest, the annual Halloween party on State Street, looked a little different this year. With Dane County's strong emphasis on limiting crowds due to the COVID-19 pandemic, police put a stop to any large social gatherings in the area. While there was a strong police presence, Public Health Madison and Dane County are still investigating at least 13 residents who threw parties over the weekend. Those in violation could face fines up to $1,000 or more. This past year, you've probably spent more time at home. So what makes a home special? Check out this local art exhibit that creates a home away from home. Until November 8th, the Garver Feed Mill is hosting an art exhibit which makes emotional connections to viewers, fostering memories of home by building huge mattress forts. Like a lot of people have said, oh, my grandmother had that one yellow striped sheet or this one smells like my mom's linen closet. You can see the show inside or outside of the building. At the end of the week, all mattresses will be donated. Be sure to stop on by and see this art that is knocking on the hearts of many. So it's sort of like sharing the community, our personal experiences in spaces that can create different dynamics. Following multiple student requests in a virtual meeting on October 28th, Chancellor Rebecca Blank has agreed to meet with diversity groups twice a semester. This is after the organization said in a September article that Blank is not doing enough to ensure that the UW-Madison BIPOC Coalition students are seen, 
heard, protected, and respected on campus. Blank told student activists that change would most likely come through lower school officials and not through monthly meetings with her. A new working group for Dane County named the K-12 Emotional Wellness Work Group will help the mental health needs of young children. Along with this clinic, the Rainbow Project, another mental health clinic, is working to address children's mental health needs. The Badger Report's Stephen Potter has the story. Young children these days are feeling alone and isolated. Because of the coronavirus pandemic, they're scared and uncertain about the future. And many of these children just aren't getting the emotional help they need to cope with these feelings. There are a number of young people in the community that don't necessarily seek out or are, are receiving services through traditional mental health services where you need to go to a clinic. To solve this problem, Dane County is working with therapy clinics to provide mental health help directly to young children through their local community center. One such clinic is the Rainbow Project, which will provide counseling to children at the Kennedy Heights Community Center on the north side of Madison. Let's do some early intervention. Um, and really make sure that what is normal challenging behavior and when is it something that is maybe more serious that now early on we can um, provide support for that will reduce risks and more severe problems from occurring in the future. Cato adds that these are unprecedented times in many ways. During these times, um, I think families that are experiencing stress um, are experiencing more on many different levels. Cato says that beginning soon, therapists will be having meetings with children through Zoom and will expand to meetings in person when it's safe. For the Badger Report, I'm Stephen Potter. Thanks, Stephen, and it's great to see Dane County's efforts to help those in need. Adding to an already impressive resume, the University of Wisconsin-Madison is one of four finalists for a national award that recognizes schools who increase their graduation rate. The award recognizes institutions that emphasize degree completion as well as ensuring educational quality. The winner of the award will be announced at the Association of Public and Land Grant Universities on November 9th through 11th. UW-Madison students who recovered from COVID-19 were urged to donate blood at the Badger Give Back Blood Drive, as key ingredient in their blood was has the potential to save lives. The Badger Report Sally Young has more. So okay, first day I had a sore throat when I was going to bed and I was like, okay, it's the beginning. Like I know it is. UW-Madison freshman Elle Monfried knew she had COVID-19 when she began showing symptoms about a month ago. Just squeeze that every couple seconds for me. Now that she has recovered, there may be essential COVID-19 antibodies located in the plasma of her blood, which can be extracted and administered to a patient who is currently battling the virus. This process is called convalescent plasma therapy, a developing COVID-19 treatment method. We showed that when we gave convalescent plasma early, within one or two days, we were able to keep these patients out of the ICUs and off of ventilators. UW-Madison sophomore Brody Andes launched the Badger's Get Back Blood Drive after learning about Dr. Hartman's research on the efficacy of convalescent plasma on COVID-19 patients. This is probably the biggest event um, encouraging the donation of convalescent plasma. Dr. Hartman says that as COVID-19 hospitalizations rise in Wisconsin, the convalescent plasma collected at the Badger's Get Back Blood Drive will likely remain in the state. After the plasma is extracted from the donation, it will be stored here at UW Health until it can be administered to a patient in need. There's still a transfusion in there, but this is from yesterday. Dr. Hartman says the Badger's Give Back Blood Drive will provide COVID-19 convalescent plasma researchers with the largest collection of data so far. So we have, you know, about 3,000 people on campus who have recovered from, from COVID, and to have that amount of people in, in one area, and then the ability to collect uh, blood and plasma from them is just a tremendous resource. For the Badger Report, I'm Sally Young. Thanks, Sally. Hopefully the students will benefit patients down the road. Sophia joins us with the weather after the break. You can try, but you'll never stop a Badger. Because we Badgers are born with curious minds and endless heart. When we see a curve in the road, we speed up. When there are mask shortages for first responders, we make our own supply chain. When there's a world on pause, we sharpen our claws. 
through thunder, fire, and pandemics, we'll keep going. Because after all, you can't stop a badger. As the pandemic hits each community hard, homeless people are the ones who get affected the most, and temporary housing becomes an emergency since it's getting cold outside. This is true. I went to the Porchlight Homeless Shelter to take a look at the new site for the men's shelter. For almost 40 years, Porchlight has served the homeless population in Dane County. This year, they moved the men's shelter to the recreation center of Warner Park. We had tattoo parlors bringing us in, Tyvek suits and, you know, mechanics who are already wearing this type of stuff. And they're just like, we know you need it more than we do. We're safer at home. We'll give you our stuff. So it was huge community effort. The shelter is still operating out of Warner Park today with the help of volunteers. We did flu shots, we did voter registration, um, having this spread out space that we've never had before. Um, we lifted our um, annual limit. Normally men could only stay, you know, families and singles too, could only stay in shelter for 90 nights a year. And so we lifted that as soon as COVID hit so people can come every night if they so choose. But the community wants their center back so the men's shelter will have to find a permanent home elsewhere. After plans to move into a space on the east side fell through, they remain in search of a site. On Halloween, the earth was in for a special treat. Saturday marked the first time there was a blue moon in all time zones since 1944, according to the Farmer's Almanac. While most were sadly stuck spending their Halloween night inside isolating, all could enjoy the visuals up in the sky. Is it time to start getting out those winter jackets? Let's find out with Sophia Medor for the weather. All right, thanks Megan and Lily. So. Winter is not here quite yet. This whole weekend will be full of beautiful sunshine. So today we will be seeing a high of 69 with a low of 52 in the evening. Tomorrow it will be mostly sunny throughout the day with clouds filtering in and out with a high of 68 and a low of 52. Now on Sunday, as the clouds start to roll in, we'll have to sadly say goodbye to some of our sunshine, but it will still remain a high of 70 and in the evening it will get to a low of 60. So we'll be kicking off our week with some rain. Sunday night we will have a 20% chance of rain and then Monday evening we will have a 70% chance of rain. So make sure to get out there this weekend and enjoy that beautiful weather. All right, that's all I have for you guys today. Thank you so much. I'm Sophia Medor for the Badger Report. Back to you. Thanks, Sophia. It certainly has been a beautiful week in November. Coming up in sports, how will Wisconsin football return to action following their COVID-19 outbreak? Find out next on the Badger Report. You can try, but you'll never stop a Badger. Because we Badgers are born with curious minds and endless heart. When we see a curve in the road, we speed up. When there are mass shortages for first responders, we make our own supply chain. When there's a world on pause, we sharpen our claws. Through thunder, fire, and pandemics, we'll keep going. Because after all, you can't stop a badger. While the election was heating up in Wisconsin, Badger football was cooling off on the sidelines. This weekend, the Badger Report's J.D. Danielson joins us with the latest. Thanks, Reagan. The Wisconsin football team continues to face COVID-19 issues as 10th ranked Badgers were forced to cancel this weekend's home game against Purdue. The Badgers now have 27 total cases, and this is the second consecutive week Wisconsin has had to cancel its regular season game. The football program has decided to suspend football activities indefinitely until cases drop. Wisconsin is expected to provide another update on November 7th. With the recent outbreak of COVID-19 virus among the Badger football team, our attention for sports was drawn to the high school action surrounding the Madison area. With boys soccer sectionals and late season football matchups underway, our games of the week come from Sock Prairie and River Valley. In a Division II sectional matchup, Sock Prairie's Eagles hosted the Dodgeville Mineral Point Co-op. Up 1-0 early, the ball works its way to Elliott Carson and the freshman Eagle finds Twine to seal the victory. 3-1 your final as Sock Prairie advanced to Saturday's final. In a routing of West Salem, Sockbury went on to win the section and advanced to the state tournament. 
The Eagles will match up with Medford today as the Wisconsin Boys Soccer State Tournament takes place across the weekend for Divisions 1, 2, and 3. In our football game of the week, Mineral Point looks to stay undefeated against a tough opponent in River Valley. Early in the first, Will Bailey under pressure finds a streaking Landon Alt, and he'll uh, social distance his way to the end zone. Alt's catch and run, untouched, leveled the lead at 7 to end the first. Later in the third, game still tied at 7, and the pointers came to life. Liam Stump slings it to Dominic McVeigh on the cross, and he barrels his way into the end zone for the eventual game-winning plunge. Mineral Point stays undefeated, 28-19. Looking ahead to next week, the pointers will remain roadbound to Lancaster. A stout 3-2 non-conference opponent, the Flying Arrows will look to have challenged the pointers as they bid to remain undefeated and number two ranked. In local prep news, next week marks the start of high school football playoffs. Shortly after midnight on Friday, the Wisconsin Interscholastic Athletic Association will release a schedule featuring 224 teams broken down into seven different divisions by school size. By Saturday morning, teams will know their first round opponent. That's all for sports. Back to you, Lillian Reagan. Thanks, JD. While COVID-19 may have brought challenges to trick-or-treating, see how a community still found safe ways to enjoy the holiday during a pandemic. You can try, but you'll never stop a badger. Because we badgers are born with curious minds and endless heart. When we see a curve in the road, we speed up. When there are mass shortages for first responders, we make our own supply chain. When there's a world on pause, we sharpen our claws. Through thunder, fire, and pandemics, we'll keep going. Because after all, you can't stop a badger. Public Health Madison and Dane County say that at least 13 campus area residencies violated public health orders over Halloween weekend. People who have tested positive continue socializing with friends and family members in both small and large groups. UW-Madison, the City of Madison Attorney's Office, and the Madison Police Department are also involved to deliver summons and complaints that could lead to large fines and disciplinary action by the university as a result of gatherings. The city may issue a fine of up to $1,000 for every violation of the health order. Halloween was a little different this year, but that didn't stop streets from being full of excited children wearing masks and walking to their neighbors to get candy. Communities came up with a creative way to treat. Some sent candy down a chute to avoid physical contact and make sure everyone was social distancing. And it's the pandemic, but I love Halloween, wouldn't give it up. So a way to keep them a little bit away, but keep them coming. Even though parents try to take proper precautions while their kids are trick-or-treating, for children, this is not an easy task. While many locals were generously serving trick-or-treaters, some neighbors put signs in the yards with apologies for not providing any sweets. That's it for this week's broadcast. Thanks for tuning in. For the Badger Report, I'm Reagan Zimmerman. And I'm Lily Zoller. Have a great weekend.